never stop. Our mission in life is to continue to go, run, seek, find more people to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, all right? But before I dive into all of that, let's just get real for a minute this morning. How many of you are here this morning, and if you're being honest, you're just saying, Pastor Mike, quite frankly, I'm just tired today. Where are those people at right there? And maybe, I know that you're here. I know that some of you are here this morning. Maybe you're even thinking, the last thing that I needed was that big, loud hype video coming on. And then Pastor Mike with all that energy up there telling me to go, run, seek, find, and never stop. I actually just want to stop. I want to stop and smell the roses for a minute. Where are you at? How many of you feel like that this morning? Sorry, I'm going to bring it today, okay? But I know sometimes we feel like that in life. I, I, I get tired. Sometimes I wish that life would just slow down. Sometimes when I tell myself, never stop, I just don't even believe it. Sometimes I just want to stop. Sometimes I want to catch my breath. But I want to propose something to all of you this morning, to all of us today. The problem isn't necessary, necessarily the fact that we're busy. The problem is more, what is it that we're busy doing? What is it that we're busy doing? What I love about the end of the book of Romans, the last half of chapter 15 and all of chapter 16 is, to me, the way that I see it, it is a manual for healthy ministry. And the message title that we have for you today is Prioritize People. Prioritize People. We've reached chapter 16. We're in the final chapter of the book of Romans. There's probably this message and one more message left, and then we are wrapping up the book of Romans. And I think we've done a pretty good job covering this book in one year exactly. So I think that's pretty phenomenal. This book has been a blessing to me as we've gone through this. But in the passage today that we're going to be looking at, in the 16 verses that we're going to cover, Paul greets... 26 people, two families, three house churches, and then he recommends one other person to the church at Rome. So that gives us a total of 27 names in 16 verses. Can I tell you this morning that people matter? People matter. Now, I don't know about you. Are you glad that we did not read all 16 of these verses. If you scan your eyes down through there, there is a lot of names in there. Dan could barely get out Centria a little bit ago, okay? So I, I could have, I almost thought about it. I was like, man, I could really torture somebody today and I could give them all 16 of these verses to read through. There are some big names in there, some unrecognizable names in there, um, but I decided not to do that. We'll kind of work our way slowly through some of that as we go through our message this morning. But I want you to understand that, that people matter. And what stands out to me as we go through that is, is as we go through these verses is that they aren't just saturated with names. They are also saturated with different relationships, with different types of partnerships. It's 16 verses that is saturated with genuine affection, with genuine love. And most importantly, these 16 verses that, that we could so casually just read through and say, it has nothing to do with me because they're just these people that I don't know. And Paul's just throwing out personal compliments. No, these 16 verses are saturated with the person of Jesus Christ himself. And what I want us to understand this morning is that the more that we prioritize people, the more different and enriching ways they will bring blessings into your life. The more that you prioritize people, the more that life isn't just about doing and being busy and accomplishing so many things, but the more that it's about the people that God places in our life and the more that it's about making a difference in their lives, the more you will understand the way that they begin to benefit your life and the way that they begin to bless your life so that you begin to collect a list of names of people that you would greet that have been a blessing to you. The more that you find yourself on a list of somebody else's names because of the ways that you have been a blessing to them. And so prioritize people. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And we're just going to jump right into it. Okay, so the first thing that I want us to understand this morning is this. Women matter. Women matter. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. Verses 1 and 2, actually, and uh, we're going to read them one more time. It says this, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, 
which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become as saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Now, what's happening here is Paul is commending or he's recommending Phoebe to the church at Rome. She's the only person that is not already at the church of Rome. She's headed to the church at Rome. All other 26 people that he's going to mention are already there in the church of Rome. So why would he be recommending her? Why would he be commending her to the church? And the simplest answer that you can come to is Phoebe is the one that is carrying the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans to Rome. She's the one that's taking it with her. And it was very common in those days to travel with a letter of recommendation because they did not have hotels and they did not have Airbnbs. And so it was good if you knew somebody that knew somebody to get a letter from somebody to that person saying, hey, I know who this person is. Put them up in your house. Take care of them. Feed them. Help them with any connections that they need while they're there to make their time worthy. That's what Paul's doing for Phoebe here. Now, Phoebe's an interesting woman. We don't know a lot about her besides what these two verses say, but these verses actually tell us quite a bit about who Phoebe was. Number one, Phoebe was more than likely a wealthy businesswoman. Now, you might be wondering, how in the world do you come up with that from the verses that we just read? Well, well, number one, she had resources to be able to travel to Rome. That was not an easy thing to do. And then Paul also says in those verses He commends to the church, he says, help her in whatever business that she has while she's there. So she has the resources, she has a reason and a purpose for going to Rome. And I could see even Paul saying, hey, you're going to Rome? I got a letter that I want to send to Rome. Let me write that and then you take that with you when you go to Rome. I could see it all coming together in that type of a way. But also at the end of verse 2, it even gives us a bigger hint. At the very end of verse 2, it says, For she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Does anybody know what that word succorer means? She's not a sucker, okay? Not like that. But a succorer, that's just an old English word, and it just means that she was a patron or a benefactor. She was somebody who helped a lot of other people along the way. She was from Centria. That's what the Bible tells us. Centria was a port city about eight miles from the city of Corinth. And that city would have exposed her to many people that were traveling. And Paul says that she was a benefactor of many. She probably helped many Christian travelers by putting them up in her house and taking care of them. And she also took care of Paul as well. Many scholars believe that Paul was spending the winter in Centria, which was really close to the city of Corinth, that he was more than likely writing this letter even from her house. And so she had wealth and she had means and she had the ability to be able to take care of people Phoebe was likely a wealthy businesswoman. But that's not really what Paul wants us to understand or see about Phoebe. There's a couple other things. He says, okay, help me out in verse 1. Put verse 1 back up on the screen. You all help me out, okay? He says this, I commend unto you, Phoebe, what are the next two words? Our sister. Now, Paul's not just recommending his sister to the church at Rome. He's recommending our sister. He's saying, hey, she's not just my sister, she's your sister. And you know what that means for us today, too? She's not just their sister, she's also our sister, even today. And this is just a reminder that when we become Christians, when we become believers, we are a part of something that is so much bigger than ourselves. We belong to his church. I I love those shirts. You're going to be hearing a lot this year about believe, belong, become. Hey, you belong to God's church. You are a part of the family of God, and we are a part of something that is so much bigger and so much greater than ourselves. Now, this goes a little bit further, too. I want you to see this. He says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. And then he says in verse 2, that you receive her in the Lord. Everybody help me with those next three words. As becometh saints. You receive her as become as saints. Now, again, I don't know about you, but typically when I read through passages like this, I just am like, oh, there's a whole bunch of names. We can skip over this and go through it really quickly. But we don't need to do that. He says to receive her as become as saints. That should not be something that we're just like, oh, yeah, she's a saint. She's a Christian. And we just browse over that quickly. No, receive her as a saint, as a holy one. 
as a child of God, as somebody who's been saved and set free and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Paul puts a high value and priority on people. He doesn't just look at Phoebe as a commodity, as a connection that he can use to help him on his way. Hey, I need a place to stay. She's wealthy. She's got a house. Hey, she's going to Rome. She can carry a letter. That's not how Paul views her. She's not just somebody that's dispensable that he can use to further advance what he's trying to do. No, he says, she is a saint of God. She is my sister, and you ought to receive her as such. Hey, roll out the red carpet for her. Treat her like a member of your family, because that's exactly who she is. Now, I don't have a lot of time to break this down. One of the interesting things that I came across while I was studying this passage that just stood out to me so well is in this list of names, in this list of 27 names that he mentions, many of those, if you study history, would be names that would be associated with slaves. Some were associated with wealthy people. And I'm just pointing this out, that when we receive one another in the Lord as becometh saints, here's Phoebe, a wealthy businesswoman, and she's gladly taking Paul's letter of recommendation, and she's taking it to this church at Rome, and you know who she very may well receive help from? People that were of a lower class than her, people that were different from her, but inside the body of Christ, there is no slave, and there is no free, and there is no rich, and there is no poor, and there is no white, and there is no black. There is only one family. There is only one race. There is only saints. And that's who we are in Christ Jesus. And I just got to tell you, that, that's something that speaks to my heart every time I stop and think about it. We are a part of something that completely transforms and changes everything. All right, before we move on, y'all got to talk to each other this morning, okay? feel like we need to break this up. I want you to look at the person next to him, and I want you to tell him, you are a saint, Go ahead, tell them. You know what? I'm getting a kick out of something right here. I'm watching a married couple right here on the front row. I know these two. He's like, I don't know if I can tell her that. I don't know if she can tell him that. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, okay, now I want you to look at somebody, and I want you to really mean it this time. Like, no, you really are a saint. Now mean it this time, okay? Tell them. Oh, man, that went way better than I thought. That was awesome right there. Listen, even though we are far from perfect, even though we fall so far short of God's glory, one of the awesome things that we've learned in Romans is that when God sees us, he doesn't see us. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are saints not because there's anything good about us, but because there's everything good about him. And that's how we ought to view one another. That's how we ought to see one another, not in our faults and our failures and in our problems and in how we can use one another or how we can gain advantages, but as children that are redeemed by the mercy and grace of Jesus. And the last thing I want to just point out about Phoebe is that she was a servant of the church. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister which is a servant of the church, which is that century. I think this is probably what stood out to Paul the most about Phoebe. She was a servant. She was a minister. She took all of her resources, all of her wealth, all of her talents, and all of her abilities, and she didn't use it to advance herself and to make her life better, but she poured it out in sacrificial service to others. And as a result of that, she was given a huge task of delivering Romans, a book in the Bible, God's holy word, to a church that was in desperate need of it. And God memorializes her even here in the book of Romans where we're talking about her 2,000 years later. Now, you might remember way back when I started this, I said... The point that I want us to see here is that women matter. Now, you might be saying, well, duh, we know that. Why in the world would you bring something like that up today without trying to open up a huge, giant can of worms, okay? I'm not going to try to go down this road too long. I bring this up for a very important reason. There is a false narrative that exists in our world today 
that somehow the Bible teaches or that God promotes male supremacy, female oppression, and that, that's, that's what the Bible that's what the Bible promotes. There's a false narrative. There's a lot of people that try to, to spin that type of teaching and that type of rhetoric onto the church and onto God. But passages like this prove that nothing could be further from the truth. For instance, not only does Paul hold Phoebe in high regard as he goes through this list, he mentions at least seven other women who played a vital role in his life and in his ministry that were a huge blessing to him. And so a practical application before we move on is this. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the lies. God's design and God's plan has been under attack since day one, and it is under attack, full-fledged in our world today, just because the Bible teaches. By the way, the Bible does teach, and God did design male leadership in the home and in the church. The Bible clearly teaches that. It does not mean, though, that a woman is less than a man. God designed men and women to complement each other. Men and women are created equal, okay? Do you understand? We are created equal. We are both image bearers, created in the image and likeness of God, but we are different. And guess what? Our differences are beneficial. We live in a world today that can't even tell if there's a basic difference anymore between men and women, and we all know by common sense, there are differences between men and women. And guess what? They're beneficial differences because that's how God created us to be. He created us to be different so that we could complement each other and accomplish great things for his honor and for his glory. The Bible is full of just so many treasures. Like You can study it Week in, week out, until the day you die and always be learning new things. Last night, I learned something new that just was a blessing to me. <laughs> in Genesis chapter 2, when you go way back to God's created design and God's created order, he says all of his creation is good. And then he comes to Adam and he says, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now, every time I'm at a wedding, I pretty much always crack a joke about that in the wedding ceremony. I was like... God said everything was good, but man wasn't good, and man needed a helper. And that's not really true, but, you know, we, we sometimes will just play into the jokes along those lines. But that's what he says. It was not good that the man should be alone. I will create and help me for him. Now, when we hear that word helper, our world automatically just begins to go down that road of, like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm subjugated to as a woman. I'm supposed to cook and clean and do all of these types of things. Can I tell you th- There's so much more to what God is trying to say in his word. That word for help me is a really awesome word. It's the word in Hebrew called ezer. And you know what? That word is only used twice in reference to a woman, and it was used twice in reference to Eve. It's used three times in reference to help in battle. But the other 16 times that it's used throughout the Old Testament, it is used in direct reference to God. And one of the most famous verses that probably everybody in here is going to know and understand is in Psalms when David says, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? Where does my my Ezra come from? David's in a desperate situation and he's lifting up his eyes and he's looking to the hills. And you know what he says? My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you understand? That's how that word is used multiple times. And you got to understand the context. God didn't just put us on this world to accomplish nothing. He put Adam in this world and he said, hey, you got to subdue the earth. I'm giving you dominion over the earth. He gave him a huge responsibility. And he said, you know what? He needs a helper. He needs somebody to come alongside who can support and lift and build that up in incredible ways. He didn't give us something minor to do, something that, that's just little to do in this world. No, he gave us a huge responsibility to let his light shine, to glorify God, and to subdue this earth, and to bring honor and glory to him in all that we say and all that we do. And you know what? The reality is we both need each other. We need each other desperately. And I'm pointing all this out for the fact that the Bible promotes strong, successful, and capable women all over the place. There are some great women heroes in the Bible. And you know how these things work together. I just, I thought this was really cool. Phoebe didn't write the book of Romans. Paul wrote the book of Romans. But God entrusted her to take the book of Romans and to deliver it. 
This was most likely the only copy of the book of Romans that existed at that time. Paper was expensive. It wasn't likely that Paul copied it before he sent that out. He may have just wrote it, handed it to her. That was the only copy of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible word. He hands it to Phoebe. Phoebe delivers it, and then God takes it and does what he does with it and spreads it out, and here we are using it 2,000 years later together today. And all I'm trying to say is if all our thinking is is minor and small as and this goes for men and women both, as I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do, and I'm going to try to prove that I'm more than this or I'm more than that. We're missing the whole picture. What we've got to do is submit and surrender ourselves to how God designed us to be. Men, submit yourself to how God created you to be. Women, submit yourself to how God created you to be. Then get busy living for the honor and glory of God. And when we do that, we will complement each other in incredible ways where we can turn cities upside down for Christ and we can advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and we can make a difference. Don't fall for the lies and the narrative of this world. That's where they want us to live our lives. Debating and arguing and talking about and rebelling against God's created order, no submit to it, surrender to it, and get busy living for God's honor and for God's glory, and watch your life be blessed and satisfied and fulfilled in unbelievable ways. I could go down that road even further, and I just want, I'll just say one more thing, okay? I told you, it could be a giant can of worms. I'm just trying to stay focused on this, but I think a bigger problem in our world today than even women using their talents and abilities is that men are shirking their responsibility at stepping up and being the leaders that God created them to be. And there are a lot of men that are on the sidelines. And we're to be the picture of Christ in our home. And we're to serve selflessly and sacrificially. That's how we lead. And we need to be the spiritual leaders. And our wives shouldn't be prodding us along. Hey, go pray with the kids. Hey, are you going to come to church with me this Sunday? No, that's nonsense. We wonder why our world's in the position that it's in today. It's because we're not the people that God wants us to be. And we got to step up. And we got to surrender and step into the responsibilities that God has laid out for us. And when we do that and when we complement each other the way that God created us to, it's beautiful. And we'll show the world what they're missing out on and what they're not seeing. And so we all have a responsibility to step up and to be used for God, for his honor and for his glory. The second thing that I want us to see this morning is this. If you're going to prioritize people, you have to realize that Christ matters. Christ matters. Look at verses three and four. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. And then verse five, likewise greet the church that is in their house. Here we're introduced to Priscilla and Aquila, who were longtime friends and partners of Paul. They first met in Corinth. I don't know how many years earlier, but they first met in Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla were forced to leave Rome because of the persecution of the Christians, and they end up in Corinth, and you know what they are? They are tent makers. That's what their occupation is, and guess what Paul's occupation was? A tent maker. So he gets to Corinth, and he finds out about these other tent makers, so he goes and he looks up Aquila and Priscilla, and Aquila and Priscilla give Paul work, and Paul stays with them, and they begin to form an incredible partnership. But what I want you to really understand is what Paul said about them in verse 3. Everybody look at that. Put that up on the screen. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my what? Helpers in his helpers in Christ Jesus. More and greater than the business partnership that they formed together. You know what they did? They built people and they built churches together. They served God and they built the church at Corinth. And then later, um, Priscilla and Aquila moved to Ephesus and Paul goes to Ephesus and they, they build a church and they see people saved there. And Aquila and Priscilla were instrumental in discipling a man by the name of Apollos who was a great orator and a great preacher of the faith. And so God uses them there. And now they're back in Rome. They have a church in their house. And Paul is looking forward to the opportunity to getting to Rome and to partnering with his friends once again to do more work in building the kingdom of God together. And so Priscilla and Aquila are his helpers in Christ Jesus. Now, there's something those verses told us that really stands out to me. Somewhere along the line, they risked their lives to save Paul. 
How many of you think you would be indebted to somebody who risks their life to save you? <laughs> I mean, that's going to be somebody that has a very special place in my heart forever. Somewhere along the line, they risked their lives to save Paul. I, I just say to that, why? Why, why would they do that? you, you got to understand, Priscilla and Aquila were a married couple that were wealthy enough to travel in the ancient world. How many of you agree that you got to have wealth to be able to travel in our modern world today? It's not too cheap to be able to travel. They had enough means and finances to be able to travel. They left Rome. They went to Corinth. They went to Ephesus. They're back in Rome. And they're back in Rome, and there's a church that is meeting in their house. So they're wealthy enough to travel. They have the means to be able to own their own home. This, wasn't, this was something that was a little bit more than ordinary at that time. These were wealthy people, and yet they're not living for themselves. They're out there risking their lives to save Paul. They're out there risking their lives by having a, a church in their house. I mean, Paul's going to get his head chopped off for being a Christian. There was persecution of Christians in Rome even back at this time, and yet they're living for the kingdom of heaven, and they're willing to put their lives on the line. Why? Why would they do that? And the simple answer is this. Jesus changes everything. How many of you agree? Jesus changes everything. Totally turns everything upside down. Greater than the danger of actively living out their faith was the danger that they were in before they got saved. Do you understand that? Greater than the danger that they faced by actively living out their faith was the danger that they were in before they were saved, before faith in Christ. They were in as much danger as you could possibly be. They were literally one breath away from dying and stepping into eternity in hell. You understand that? Man, this morning while I was walking, I was reminded of Shepard actually when he was three years old. The Lord just brought this to my mind. I'm just praying. We're walking, thinking through the message. And when Shepard was three, he, it was right before he turned four, somewhere around there, and he just started asking a lot of questions about the gospel. And he's like, Dad, I know I'm a sinner, and I know Jesus died for me, and I know that if I die, I'm, I'm going to spend eternity and go to hell. We're having a talk on the couch one night, and I was like, he's still pretty young, but he's got a pretty good understanding about it. And I was like, Shepard, this is good. I'm so glad you know this stuff. He's like, hey, why don't you just go get ready for bed, and we'll talk about this more later. I don't want to try to push my kids into doing anything, especially at such a young age. And you know what he did on that couch? He started crying right there. And he said, Dad, how could you do that to me? If I go to bed right now and Jesus is not my Savior and I die, I'm going to go to hell. And I sat there and I said, how could I do this to him? I was like, this is a person that understands. He gets it. Now, there's some people here you might think, man, this is like, this is dramatic talk. I mean, heaven, hell, eternity. I mean, this is the stuff of fairy tales. No, this is the stuff of real life. I know that every single person asks themselves those questions. What's going to happen to me after I die? The Bible answers those questions very clearly. We are sinners. We are broken. We can't do anything to save ourselves. But Jesus did it for us. He left heaven and he went to the cross and he died because the punishment for my sin was death. And on the cross, he died and he took my place. And all I have to do is believe on him and I can be saved. The Bible tells me that. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you? that you are literally one breath away from stepping into an eternity in hell. That's real. That's re Let that just sink in. For those of you that are saved, do you remember how real that moment was when you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Do you remember the relief that came flooding into your soul? Like, I'm saved. I'm secure. I have Jesus. I know that I have, heaven's my home. I know that I have a Savior. I know that I have a relationship with God. You remember the relief that came flooding your soul when all of that hit you? Do you understand that, that Paul never got over being saved? Apollo, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they never got over being in Christ Jesus. And as a result of what God did for them, they devoted and dedicated every single ounce and fiber of their life to reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't get over salvation. Here's the practical application. Don't get over salvation. 
Paul never did. Look at verse 5. Look at the end of it. He says, salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Man, Eponidas and Paul had a really special relationship. Why? You know why they did? Because Eponidas was the first convert that Paul had when he started his ministry in Achaia. Could you imagine going to a brand new city where you know nobody, where there's no church established, where there's people who had never heard the gospel, who know who Jesus is, and he starts teaching, and he starts preaching, and he starts having one-on-one conversations, and I don't know if they had coffee shops back then. Maybe he took them to a coffee shop. I don't know what they had, but maybe they're sitting on the side of the road. But Eponidas finally places his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and Paul says, hey, my well-beloved Eponidas in Christ Jesus. Man, he never got over the joy of seeing other people get saved. Look at verse 7. He says, Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Now, these two people were in Christ before Paul. But you know what's interesting? He says that they were his kinsmen. They were probably Jewish people. And he also says that they were his fellow prisoners. And then he says that they were in Christ before him, which means that if they were Jewish, they probably knew who Paul was, that he was the chief martyr of the church, that he was the chief persecutor of the church. It could have even been Paul himself that put these two in prison. I don't know. I'm not saying that emphatically, but it could have been. They were in Christ before Paul. But somewhere along the line, they end up in prison together. And you know what? They suffered for Christ together. And as a result of it, they had a bond in Christ Jesus. These two people were special to him. This married couple was. And the gospel totally turns everything upside down. They probably sat there and they looked at Paul and they said, I can't even believe you're here right now. Man, the stories we have heard about you, how you have terrorized the church, and here you are and here for me, and Paul tells them about how he got saved and what Christ did in his life, and they tell Paul about how they got saved, and they rejoice, and there's a bond even in suffering because of what Christ had done for them. If you go down through verse 15, which we're not going to do, you're going to find phrases like, beloved in the Lord, our helper in Christ, approved in Christ, chosen in the Lord. Remember when I said it's saturated with Christ? It's saturated in the Lord. Do you understand that because of Jesus Christ, we are beloved, we are helpers, we are approved, we are chosen? Can I tell you this morning, don't get over your salvation. Radically prioritize people. Do you understand today that we are as safe as we can possibly be? Does anybody think that this world is like in a big giant mess? Is everything just feels like it's turned upside down? I say this on a regular basis. I think one thing that all Americans can agree on is that it's a mess. And it feels scary. And I know sometimes Christians, if you turn on the news, man, and even worse than the news, if you get on social media, you will find just all kinds of crazy stuff that's happening and that's taking place. And you know what it can do? It can create inside of us a fear as Christians that like, what, what's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to Christians? Are, are we going to be persecuted or is it going to become illegal like it was for Paul and them to, to teach the truth of God's word? Are we going to become marginalized? Can I just tell you something this morning? We are as safe as we can possibly be. We know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're not in fear of what's going to happen in eternity. And we need to live like Aquila and Priscilla and Paul, who literally, literally faced life and death. Literally faced being in prison. We act like that that's happening. There's nothing can be further from the truth right now. That's not happening today. We have every freedom to stand up and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know what we're doing? We're busy living our own lives. We're busy sitting and attacking from behind our computers and throwing out all kinds of negativity in this world. We're busy just getting by and focusing on the American dream and our families and our comfort and our security. And all the while, our world is getting further and further from Christ because we, again, are shirking the responsibility that we have as believers. we got to radically prioritize people. Let me ask you. Who are you longing for to be saved? 
Who are you actively working on? Who are you getting on your knees and crying out to God and literally crying and begging God that he would open up their eyes and save that person and bring them back to Christ? Man, if we're not doing that, are we focused on the right things? I speak this to myself. I'm not, I, believe me, I am not attacking you this morning. I'm passionate about what I'm saying, and I am reminding myself. Hey, what partnerships are we forming to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? How are we using our home? How are we using our jobs? How are we using our resources to prioritize people so that people will believe in Jesus and his transforming power? So that people will belong to his church, so that people will become everything that God created them to be. I believe with every single fiber of my being that there is hope for America. I believe that we can see revival. I believe that we can see America return to a country that has a healthy respect for God, if we as believers would radically prioritize people and we get on our knees and we'd go before God and we'd ask him to do a work that, that we're not capable of doing, but that he'd help us to use our life and our resources and center everything around people and reaching them for Christ. And the last thing I want us to see is that serving matters. Serving matters. I love the simplicity of this passage. We've already learned about Phoebe, who was a servant. We've already learned about Priscilla and Aquila, who were helpers in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6. He says, Greet Mary, who bestowed much what? Much labor on us. I mean, Mary was someone, I don't know what she did, but she labored. She served Paul and maybe Aquila and Priscilla and other people that worked with him. Look at verse 9. He says, salute Urbane, our what? Helper. Okay, you all are going to help me out here, okay? Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And Stachys, my beloved. Then look down at verse 13. I love verse 13. He says, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And then look what he says. And his, and his mother and mine. I, I love Rufus. Okay, so you got Mary you got Aquila, you got Priscilla, you got all these people, you know what they're doing? They're, they're just, they're helping, they're serving. Then you come to Rufus, and you come to a statement like this that just makes me understand that Paul is as human as every single one of us are in here. You ever just think certain people in the Bible are just like elite and at another level? That's how I feel about Paul, man. I'm just like, Paul's like a machine, and he's just always like, just on fire, doing everything right that you're supposed to do in your life. And he is. But along, you come across a verse like this, and he says, and salute Rufus, man, and his mother and mine. Now, she wasn't his biological mother. Rufus wasn't his brother biologically. He was a brother in Christ. But I just think that that's interesting. It just brings life down to real perspective. How many of you agree that having a second mom somewhere along the way is pretty awesome? I think that that wealthy business women like Phoebe are pretty incredible. They do amazing things for the kingdom of God. But you know what you don't do in a wealthy businesswoman's house all the time? You don't go in there and open up the refrigerator, grab some food, sit down on the couch, pull out the recliner, and turn on the TV. You just don't always feel comfortable like that. But you know where you do that? You do that in somebody else's home. That's like Rufus's mother was like a place where Paul just could go and feel like he was at home. I was thinking about this passage the other day. I was thinking of Miss Tina. Is Miss Tina in here? She's in children's church. She'll be here in the second service. She's our school secretary. She's an awesome lady. You know what? When I'm having a rough day and I need some encouragement, I just go to Tina because I always know she's going to say really nice things. She's going to tell you how great the world is. She's going to put a big smile on their face. And you know what else she does? She gives me goldfish and candy. I kid you not, I'm 44 years old, and she whips out the gold. I feel good again, man. I got my goldfish and candy. I feel like a little kid again. Tina's like one of those people that's just like, Another mom, she probably feels like that to so many people in here. She's like a grandma to so many of the kids in our church and in our school. There's just people like that that, that have that, a different type of a touch, and God uses that to minister. Do you understand what we're trying to say here? Paul had a lot of helpers, a lot of special relationships. <laughs> the church at Rome had helpers. Look at verse 12. He says, salute Tryphena and Trophosa, who labor in the Lord. So Trifina and Trifosa, probably a married couple who worked and did, uh, I, a lot of people don't even think Paul knew who these people was. He just heard about their reputation. And so he's talking to them. They're at the church at Rome. And then he says, salute the beloved Persis. 
which labored much in the Lord. Persis was that guy that, like, you needed something done, you called up Persis. He's beloved by everybody because you need a servant, man, you call that guy, he'll drop whatever he's doing. He'll be there on a dime to come help you out and to meet a need. That's just the kind of person that he was right there. The church at Rome had helpers. Here's a question. How many of you can be helpers? Nobody? (laughs) It was a real question. (laughs) How many of you can be helpers? I can be a helper. I can be a... All that God wants us to be, do you understand? God just wants us to be servants and ministers and helpers. He wants us to labor, and he wants us to make a difference. Remember, we're talking about a list of people that Paul impacted. You want to prioritize people. Look for ways to serve. Look for ways to be a helper. And here's the last practical application. We're done. Don't be weary. Don't be weary. Serving and helping, it requires labor. It requires much labor. You know what that word labor means that we've read and mentioned multiple times as you go through these verses? That word labor means to do wearisome labor unto extreme fatigue. You know what Paul's telling us? If you're serving the Lord and you're prioritizing people, you're going to get tired. You're going to get worn out. You're going to get weary. Even to the point of extreme fatigue, you just throw yourself in bed at night and you're like, man, I am exhausted. But have you ever put yourself into bed at night and you have that extreme exhaustion, but it feels good and it feels right? Why? Because you've spent your time doing the right things. You spent your time investing in other people. You spent your time knowing that you did something that actually mattered. You did something kind. You spoke a nice word. You served somebody else. It wasn't just about you. Can I tell you this morning, don't be weary. Vicky just walked out. I was thinking about the music team this morning. This morning I pull onto our campus at 7 a.m. and there's cars starting to show up all over the place. People that get here early every single Sunday to come and to practice and to prepare so that they can put their best foot forward so that when we sing, we can sing and we can worship God wholeheartedly. Are you thankful for people like that? Are you thankful for, how many of you are thankful for our nursery? If you're a nursery worker, raise your hand. Give our nursery workers a big round of applause, man. (laughs) Hey, I know that sometimes your day shows up to go work the nursery and you're probably just thinking, today I'm really tired. I think I even have a cold. There's a sniffle. Nah, sometimes you feel that way, right? But I'm thankful for the people that are willing to serve. Hey, I'm thankful for everybody that works in our media team. How many of you have had to watch a live stream service because you're not here and you're on the road? Are you thankful for our live stream and our media? Man, I'm thankful for it. I want to tell you people that are behind cameras today and you've been standing up for a long time and my sons give me a hard time every week because I move around a lot and they got to work the whole time. And they're like, Dad, just be a little bit more still. Hey, you know what? You, You stand up there. I can't tell you the amount of times I run into people and they're like, hey, that was a good message today. And I was like, were you at church? And they're like, no, but I've watched you every single week or whatever the case. There's, there's always people. It surprises me. I, sometimes I forget that there's people that aren't here that are watching. There's hundreds of them every single week that are out there and the gospel's going forward and we're able to make a difference in people's lives. Hey, you know, you're children's workers. Sometimes it's, it's hard to want to commit to children's ministry week in, week out, over and over again. But I can tell you every single Sunday at our lunch table when we ask what they learned at church, Scarlett's sitting in here right now. She might have something that she learned from her dad, but I promise you she'll have something that she learned in junior church that she's going to go to in her next service because people take the time to pray over what they're going to teach and what they're going to present. And you know what? I know it gets wearisome. Hey, you know what's about to start? School. Where's all our school teachers at? Where are you? Well, okay, there you are. How many of you are excited and ready for another school year? Never stop. It's coming. Go run. <laughs> You're like, not yet. It's a week away. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's tiring investing your life in others and serving your life in others. It will weary you to the point of exhaustion. I know that our teachers here at the school, I know that there's nights they cry. 
There's nights they probably just want to beat their heads up against the wall. There's nights where they wonder why in the world did I surrender to do this, but they get back up and they keep doing it. And you know what? They do make a difference. I had a phone call from a dad the other day. His son's been out of our school for years, and he says, I can't tell you. I can't tell you the the difference that you've made in that boy's life. And how grounded he is in his faith and the things that his mom and I didn't teach him, but I know where he learned them at. And you don't always hear or see those types of testimonies. I'm just trying to tell you, folks, that serving is not about just filling a role. It's about people. Everything that we do is about people. It should be. And God help us if it's not. And there's a whole lot at stake. Eternity is at stake. Heaven and hell are at stake. And what we do for Christ matters. And helping and serving and meeting needs and loving and caring and just doing simple things that sometimes we don't think are that big of a deal are the things that matter and are the things that make a difference. And I want to tell you this morning, don't be weary. Don't be afraid. Don't let the world and their lies get to you and, and, and throw you off track. No, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and get up every day and keep loving and keep investing and keep praying and keep hoping and keep living and keep being faithful and keep doing the things that you know are right to do and keep making a difference in people's lives. And thank God for the people that have made a difference in your life. And then ask God for somebody that you can reach out to today and you can make a difference in their lives and continue to support and hold one another up and don't get weary because God's doing things that can only be done for his honor and for his glory 